I look at the American church, I am often discouraged. The reality, statistically, and we see this in our own region, churches are closing, young people are leaving the faith, leadership is falling apart. But when I look at our church family, I stop looking at all those out there, and I look at our church family, I am encouraged. We have leaders who deeply love Jesus and sincerely follow the way of Jesus. We have people, I see you, I see our families, moms and dads and old people, young people, all the range in between who are sincerely trying to walk the way of Jesus, who sincerely are seeking God, want that deep transformation from the inside out, want to love our community like Jesus. And I'm particularly encouraged by what's happening among our young people, and I'm not just talking about all the babies, but I mean our 20-somethings. Um, I don't know if you know this, but in the last year, our staff has gotten decidedly younger. As in most of them, uh, I have t-shirts that are older than they are. (laughs) Not joking. Not exaggerating. Um, One of those is Henry Hutchinson. Henry is our production assistant, and uh, I've asked him to preach this morning. Henry is young. He is gifted, smart, he's young, (laughs) but he also is humble and has a godly ambition for Jesus and his church that isn't about him, but is really, truly about seeing God's mission in his church. And for that reason, I want to give him the pulpit, and I want us to be part of fanning into flame the gifting that God's given him. So this moment, his first time preaching here, is actually a great privilege for us. And so with that spirit, I want you to be nice, and I want you to give Henry a warm news story welcome. Good morning, church. My name is Henry, and I have the great privilege of bringing you the word today. I want to tell you a little bit about myself, um, but as I'm doing that, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 131. Uh, The the words will be here on the screens next to me, um, but I would encourage you to open the word in your hands. Currently, I am a seminary student at the John W. Rawlings School of Divinity at Liberty University, uh, where I am pursuing my Master's of Divinity. I am a graduate of the Templeton Honors College at Eastern University, uh, where I received my bachelor's degree in philosophy and theology. Uh, I'm originally from a town in central Jersey, does exist. Uh, It's just outside of Trenton. Um, And and I always like to say that I I grew up in the church. By that, I don't mean that I attended on Sundays or any day in between. What I mean is that my mom worked at our church. And so in the summers, uh, instead of getting a babysitter, my sister and I, we would go to the church every single day, presumably under the watchful eyes of God. In my free time from seminary work, I am a full-time fishmonger. Uh, I serve here at New Story Church in a part-time role as the production assistant. Funny story about uh, my work here at New Story. So for a while, I had been watching these YouTube videos. I've been watching them for months and months, uh, and they were all about success. Uh, All of these different videos from these extremely successful people uh, were talking about how to be extremely successful. Uh, It wasn't like I was going out of my way to find these videos. Uh, I was just scrolling through the YouTube shorts section, uh, which is basically just a collection of quick videos uh, that are meant to grab your attention quickly and convey some message quickly. 
Uh, well, well, these videos, they were pretty clear. you got to be successful. And so I thought, well, great. How do I do that? A common thread in a lot of these videos uh, was that the worst that can happen is that somebody says no. Not qualified? Just apply anyway. So one night, I was feeling particularly ambitious, and, and so I found a, a listing uh, that required several years of formal ministry experience. Of course, as a recent college graduate who's still pursuing my MDiv, I was very clearly not qualified for this position, uh, but I figured that the worst that could happen is that they say no. So I applied. Uh, much to my surprise, uh, I got a response back uh, that basically said, hey, uh, thanks for applying. You're not qualified. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, no, sure. Um, but then Paul continued to reach out, uh, continued to talk with me, continued to pursue a relationship with me uh, to the point where we were able to find a position that would best suit my experience and abilities. So that's how I became the production assistant at New Story Church. In my brief time working here and observing the different things going on, I slowly began to realize that I was completely wrong. No wasn't the worst thing that they could have said to me. The worst they could have said was yes. See, see it was my plan to jump the gun, not God's. See, I, I was untested, unqualified, and, and altogether unprepared for the work that I had tried to do. The worst that they could have possibly said to me would have been yes. But instead, by having my ambitions quieted, I am in a position where I can humbly and faithfully serve God, which brings an immense amount of peace. See, I, I was trying to arrange the, the puzzle pieces of, of my life to my liking. Uh, see, I, I was convinced that the way to, to go out and to get peace uh, was, was by doing that, by trying to fit the puzzle together myself. But that was very clearly not the case. Maybe you've experienced something similar where you tried to pursue your own ambitions and God gave you the blessing of telling you no. Or perhaps you weren't so fortunate and you regretted receiving the very thing that you wanted. Well, today, we will be uh, looking at Psalm 131, where we will see how the only way to find peace in your relationship with God is to be humble, to be quiet, and to be content. Let's begin reading at verse 1. A Song of Ascents of David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together in your name this morning. We ask that you would fill this room with your presence and with your spirit, that you would speak into the hearts and the souls and the lives of all those who have come before you today. In the name of your son we pray, amen. See, we see our author here, David, say in verse one, my heart is not proud, Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Many scholars would agree that this psalm was written early on in David's life, uh, most likely while he was still in Saul's courts. Now, at, at this point, 
David had been accused of having some ill will towards Saul, um, accused of plotting a, plotting a, a, a coup against him, all of which David denies here. What he means by not proud and, and not haughty is that he has not tried to exalt himself up to a place which he is not intended to be. He has not tried to take the throne when it was not yet given to him by God. Instead, David is humble. If you want peace, be humble. See, being humble, it's the exact opposite of being proud and haughty. Let's look to Philippians chapter 2 for our understanding of humility. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Or as C.S. Lewis famously puts it, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Now this is something that I've found myself struggling with in rough seasons of my life. When it seems like things just aren't going very well, they're not going like I want them to go, I start just thinking about myself. When people don't give me exactly what I want, when I don't get the exact job that I want, when someone that I'm counting on doesn't show up for me, well, I just think about myself. See, pride, pride tells us that we should be exalted. We should be the, the top priority in everybody else's life. And nothing else exists outside of what directly impacts us. Pride tells us that if we can sit and we can think and, and, and plan out precisely what happens and when, well, then, then we can go and get peace ourselves. Pride deceives us, and we begin to believe that we are the source of our own peace, or, or maybe that someone else is the source of our peace. If only they would love me like I want them to. If only they would give me what I want. See, pride pushes and it pushes so that we look to ourselves. We, we look at ourselves and we never look elsewhere, certainly not to God. I, I know that I am guilty of this. I, I am guilty at times of looking only at myself and beginning to meticulously plan out every little piece of my life so that if those pieces somehow, if they just all, if they all fit together, well then at the end of my five-year plan, well then I'll finally have the peace that I've sought after for so long. Is it just me? But that's a lie. And Jesus tells us that it's a lie. The night that Jesus was betrayed he was eating a meal with his disciples. It was at this meal that he revealed that he would die the next day. In John chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. He continues telling his disciples about how they will be scattered and will experience immense pain and loss. But he comforts them when he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Pride will tell you to raise yourself up. You can go, and you can go and get peace. If only you, you plan well enough. But, but surely, 
as you begin to plan and you begin to see the world around you, you will not see peace. No peace will arise in pride. And see, you, you'll begin to feel anxiety and pain. You, you'll suffer under the weight that you have placed upon your own shoulders, and you too will come to find there is no peace in pride. But Jesus, he, he tells us that, that these plans that we have, these plans that we make, they have nothing to do with our peace. We have nothing to do with our own peace. Peace is only found in and through Jesus. Jesus. The, the God who, who came down from heaven and, and humbled himself as a servant. Jesus, the God who died on the cross and rose on the third day so that death could no longer have a hold on us. So that when we struggle, and when it seems like we have no hope of peace ever again, in Jesus we can believe, and in Jesus we will find peace. To be prideful and haughty is to try and achieve your own peace. But to be humble is to seek Christ first, and peace will follow. To have peace we must be humble. The second thing that we see in this psalm is that if we want peace, we must be quiet. Verse 2 starts, But I have calmed and quieted myself. Uh, I don't really like quiet that much. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm alone in this, but... I would venture to say that quiet doesn't exactly present itself too pleasantly in our lives. I mean, it, it seems like everything that we do involves some level of noise. At work, it, it's your boss. It's your coworkers. Deadlines. When am I getting my raise? When am I getting my promotion? Elsewhere, it, it's our families, our, our parents, our spouse, if you have young children, I, I doubt you even recognize the word quiet. Even beyond human interactions, our phones are always on. Even when they're not in our hands, well, they sit in our pockets impatiently awaiting a new reason to snatch your dwindling attention span. Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, YouTube, whatever news source that you choose, whatever news source you don't choose, it's all noise, all day. It's coming from every angle, and, and it's nonstop, and it, it's just noise, noise, noise. Can't we just get some peace and quiet? All this noise, it, it's telling me that, that I'm not good enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not rich enough. I need a better house. I need a second house. I need a better job. I need a better car. Can't we just get some peace and quiet? And then God says, okay, sure. And he gives you some time to yourself where it's quiet. He gives you some time to yourself in the car, or, or at lunch, or maybe it's at night right before you go to bed, or maybe he punches you in the face with some quiet and you lose your job, or, or something that you hold so close to your heart just gets pulled out from underneath of you. Well, then what? Now that it's quiet, then what? Well, then... Well, then we fill the quiet with more noise. We just don't like quiet that much. Why is that? What is it about us and our world that we just can't bear being quiet? Well, when it's quiet, 
It's just you and your thoughts and God. That's all that there is. Have you ever walked into a retail store that had no music playing? I have. I'll save you the trouble. It's horrible. I mean, genuinely, it it feels like all eyes are on you, all ears are open to to listen to your every move. Here, it's it's your thoughts, and it's their thoughts, and they're thinking about you and what your thoughts are, and you pick up a shirt and you put it back. It's not good enough for him. I I gotta go. (laughs) I can't take it anymore. Why don't we do quiet? It's so common when making dinner, or, or, or maybe it's doing chores, to put on some music, or, or a show, maybe a, a movie, or, or even a podcast. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm not saying that there's anything inherently wrong with this. I've been known to shake it off to some Taylor Swift when I'm throwing it down in the kitchen. <laughs> but how often should this be our default? See, there's this thing with with men, particularly with men around my age. When we sit down to a meal by ourselves, the fork does not get touched until I pick out the precise, perfect YouTube video. Perhaps I just need my entertainment to bear sitting there alone. Otherwise, the quiet is suffocating. Perhaps you have your own way of drowning out the silence. Or perhaps you're sitting there and and you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Life just seems way too quiet. That's okay. Because no matter how loud or how quiet life around you is, I can promise that your prayer life is not quiet enough. What are we always told when we ask others how to pray? I can think of three main things that I was always taught in Sunday school. First, the Lord's Prayer. Great. Second, just talk to God like you're talking to a friend. Good. And third, uh, the ACTS model, uh, which is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Great. These are all great ways of, of praying. But I want to suggest a a fourth way, and this way does not replace anything, but it should be integrated with the other forms of prayer. Be quiet. God, can you do this, or, or, or can you do that? God, where do you want me to go? What job am I meant to have? God, what is your plan for my life? And then be quiet. Quiet. Friends, how can we ever hear God if we never take the time to listen? When you talk and you talk and you talk, your relationship with God, well, it suffers. It suffers because it becomes a a one-way street. It's you going to God and, and just telling him things, never taking the time to listen. You know, I I can recall uh, many years ago, my family was down the shore for vacation. The the house that we were staying in, uh, it was right on the bay. Well, bright and early one morning, my mom was making her way out the front door with her morning tea in her hand, just heading out to sit and enjoy the view. Well, little seven-year-old me asked if I could join, and of course, she obliged. My guess is that she just wanted some really great company. So we went and we found a bench and we sat there, enjoying the balmy, breezy morning, breathing in the salty air. Now at that time, one of the most important parts of my life was the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Uh, Frankly, I I was convinced that I was Captain Jack Sparrow, uh, or at least that I would be when I grew up. Uh, I I was actually Jack Sparrow for Halloween three straight years. 
I thought about wearing that costume this morning. But. And so I, I figured that I would bless my mother with some pirate stories at 7 a.m. Much to my chagrin, she wasn't exactly thrilled by this inclusion. And so she turned to me lovingly, like you do with any kid, and you turn it into a game, the quiet game. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, as competitive as I am, there was no way that I was about to lose. So, so I sat there. At first, I just wanted to be so quiet, so quiet that I would win. But then as I sat quietly, it turned at some point from a game into peace. I was all of a sudden at peace. It was calm, it was quiet, it was peaceful. You see, I, I was no longer being quiet so that I could win. I was being quiet so that I could hear. Suddenly, my ambitions to win, they didn't matter anymore. I was happy to just sit. Now, of course, I was just a kid, right? I mean, I didn't, I didn't know any better. I didn't know about how broken this world really is. So, of course, I could sit peacefully and quietly. I mean, I, I didn't know about everything that I could achieve if I just kept moving and, and kept working seven days a week. I mean, I, I didn't know about a close friend struggling with depression. I didn't know the depths that a human soul could reach to find companionship in such a lonely life. I, I didn't know about debt. I, I didn't know about hunger or, or anxiety. I didn't know the bitter sting of betrayal, the sharp pain of loss. I mean, I didn't know how void of peace this world truly is. Of course I could sit there peacefully and quietly. Well, but, but now that, you know, now that we know, how could we? Uh, how could we ever sit there, childlike, sitting patiently and quietly in the presence of God? Uh, there's a whole world of hurt out there. Sh surely there's no time for peace and quiet. We have to move. We have to make it better. We have to go and make peace. But what if we dared? What if we dared to sit childlike, in the presence of God? What if we dared to sit quietly and openly? Open to the life-changing and everlasting love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came down humbly to bear the burdens of this world on his shoulders, so that we can find peace in a broken world, but peace only through the work of Jesus Christ. What if we dared? To find peace and not earn it, we must be quiet. At first, being quiet, it may feel forced. At first, a minute, it may feel like an hour. But as you sit and as you listen, and as you quiet yourself, putting yourself in an open posture, ready to receive what God has to offer for you, then you will begin to hear. You'll begin to experience peace. Once you have been quieted before God and have stopped placing yourself at the center of your own universe, then you can begin to be content. Let's continue in verse 2. It says, I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Let's think of this image here. A weaned child. 
has just lost the one thing that they thought about at every waking moment. Awake, asleep, it doesn't matter, I'm hungry. And when the child is no longer receiving sustenance from their mother, well then what? I mean, this, this particular relationship of give and take, it's no longer happening, and it's the only relationship with their mother that this child has ever known. Now what? Well, now they are content. The child is no longer thinking, what can I get and, and when can I get it? But now they are content to just be. See, when you stop thinking about God as some, as some ATM that you can just insert prayers and requests into, and you start thinking of him as God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, who chooses, for some reason beyond my understanding, to love me and to know me, well, then you can truly start to be content just to be in his presence. We see proponents of things like the prosperity gospel who say that if you, if you have enough faith, well, then God will give you good things. And it just misses the point. Believe harder. Go, go and get your peace. What that wants is not God. You would, you would want God so that you can get money, so that you can get fame and health. Because once you have those things, well, well then I can finally have peace. See, this treats God as the means to your preferred end, not the ultimate end that he truly is. Church, that misses the point. God, you are my prize. To be with you is enough for me. To be with you is true peace. I don't always feel this way, but, but I'm learning. There's this popular singer. Many of you may have heard of him. His name is Luke Combs. He has one song called Take You With Me which paints the picture of a father and a son. See, the, the son just wants to follow his dad wherever he goes, packing a lunchbox just to go to work with him. Everything that his father did, he wanted in on it. He just wanted to be there. He was happy to just be in his father's presence, happy to do whatever he did, just as long as it was with his dad. See, this is the image that David paints for himself, that he is content not to need anything from God other than his presence. Like a weaned child, I am content. He's saying that there's nothing more that you can do, God. There's nothing more. There's nothing more that you can give me. Nothing in this world is better than just being with you. I am content. Church, are you content? Does it truly feel like God is enough for you? I'll be honest with you. I don't always feel this way. And I bet that most of you don't always feel this way too. I mean, no matter how much I, I quiet myself, no matter how much I try to quiet my ambition, quiet the noise around me, no matter how much I try to enjoy simply being in the presence of God, I still somehow find myself in a place of discontent. I still want, and I think I always will want. But if I want peace, and Lord, when the winds blow all around me, and it feels like I'm sinking, Lord, I certainly want peace, then I must learn to be content. 
this involves thinking less about what happens next. It involves thinking less about everything that I do not have and thinking more about the blessings that I have received. When you pray for things, pray not that my desires be satisfied, but that, God, your will be done. When you are on treacherous waters and the wind begins to blow harder and harder and you begin to sink, where do you turn? In Matthew 14, Jesus calls Peter out onto the waters in the middle of a storm. Peter obliges and, and walks toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. When you turn away from Jesus and begin to look at the wind that is just whipping all around you, you begin to sink deeper and deeper. See, it's not by trying his hardest to walk on the water or knowing what the wind would be. It's not because of that that Peter can do this. It is because Jesus has the power to call him out of his boat and to follow him. He is making straight the paths before us. And so it doesn't matter what the wind tells you. It's all just noise. Be content and trust what Christ has called you into, regardless of how strong the winds may seem. But still, it seems to be our natural inclination to be in a resting state of discontent. But to find peace, we must be content to be in God's presence. I mean, we, we know how turbulent our lives can get, how, how crazy every day can feel. But if we allow our pride and our ambitions to run our relationship with God, then we will never be content, not in God's presence and certainly not in this world. We must be quiet, calming ourselves for the sake of listening to God, and we must be content that even if God does not answer our prayers in the way that we want, his presence will still always be enough. David wraps it up in verse three. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Don't put your hope in yourself. Don't put your hope in your job. Don't put your hope in your friends in your family, in your wealth, in your health, certainly not in your plans. Every single one of those things, it will let you down. But by the grace and the goodness of God, he will never let you down. Give everything to God. Lay it down at the cross, and his presence will fill you up. We look back to the words of Christ from John 16. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the troubles that you face. He paid the price for you. And that doesn't mean that your problems, they'll just go away. But it means that this world, it cannot hold you captive. This broken world, it just cannot win. Your ambition, your pride, and desire for more, it'll only lead into darkness. But placing your trust and your hope in Jesus Christ alone will bring peace. If you find yourself in a place today where it's just too loud, or maybe it's just loud enough to drown out the silence, I would encourage you to find one minute each day to just sit in complete silence. Just sit. 
If you have no idea where you can find an extra minute in your day, trust me, I get it. I, I've been there. But turn down the radio on your commute to work. When you shower, don't listen to music. When you eat, don't open up YouTube. Find a place where you are drowning out the silence and make it quiet. Just be content to be in God's presence and be open and prepared to listen. In just a few moments, we're going to move into a time of communion. I encourage you to take a step back and reflect on where you are in your walk today. Perhaps you've never spoken to God before. Or perhaps you've never stopped talking to God. Either way, finding peace is never as simple as just being quiet. And it's never easy to do alone. I invite you to open the door for others to join you in that process. I'm going to pray for us here. Uh, and at the end of this prayer, we're just going to sit in silence. Don't think about where you're getting lunch or, or the breakfast you had or, or what you have planned later today or the week ahead of you or your day off tomorrow. Let's leave all that outside. Let's come and let's be present. Be present with God and be content in that reality. Let's pray. God, may you come into this room and as we listen, may you speak. May we hear what it is that you have to say. May we know you and may we love you. Amen.